So let's start with a little bit of a definition of terms. Uh, here's a question that I get asked a lot. Should I get a guardianship or should I get a power of attorney instead? It's a very commonly asked question and it's a very bad question because it's not that kind of choice. You have to understand what a power of attorney is in order to even understand what's wrong with that question. A power of attorney is something that I, a competent individual, might give to Elizabeth or Ryan, actually might give it to Elizabeth and if she can't do it, then to Ryan as the backup to make decisions for me. But when I sign a power of attorney, I have signified that I understand what I'm doing. I have, was competent when I did it. If I don't sign a power of attorney when I'm competent and I become incompetent, then Beth or Ryan are going to have to initiate a guardianship. So the way I try to explain it to people is a power of attorney is a volitional act done by a competent person to delegate authority. A guardianship is a thing done to an incompetent person to give someone else the authority to act. And so when you come in to see me and say, which one do, do, should I do? That's a, it's a false choice. My question is, is your mother or your father, whoever we're talking about, are they incapacitated? If they are, we can only talk about guardianship and what you might do to get around it. If they are not incapacitated, then yes, they might be able to sign a power of attorney. Generally speaking, powers of attorney are usually divided into two kinds. There are those that deal with healthcare decisions and there are those that deal with everything else. And everything else usually means financial things. So a power of attorney to allow Elizabeth and Ryan to go handle my bank account usually gets called a financial power of attorney, whereas a power of attorney that allows them to admit me to the nursing home usually gets called a healthcare power of attorney. There's also something called a mental health care power of attorney. I can give Ryan a power of attorney that allows him to admit me to an, a locked down psychiatric treatment ward and I can make it irrevocable so that when I'm in the ward and he's signed me in and I'm screaming, let me out, I revoke the power of attorney, Ryan can cackle meanly and say, you, you can't revoke it because you are now incapacitated by your mental illness. One of the words you often hear is durable power of attorney. Usually when people say durable power of attorney, they are probably talking about a financial power of attorney because uh, by definition, healthcare powers of attorney all have to be durable. Durable just means the power of attorney is still vi vital, still valid, if you become incapacitated. This durable power of attorney idea is pretty new. And in fact, it has taken the world by storm so much that today, Every power of attorney is durable in Arizona unless you explicitly say that it is not durable. So a durable power of attorney is no longer a very meaningful designation, but they usually mean financial power of attorney when they say that. Want a free healthcare power of attorney? Jennifer has helpfully brought me a copy of the packet that you can get from PCOA or download from the Arizona Attorney General's website, Life Care Planning is the phrase on their website that you can click on. There's nothing wrong with this power of attorney. I direct people to do it a lot. Um, and so it's a fine way to do it. But remember, you can't sign this and your mom can't sign this unless you or she is competent to understand what's going on. It will be notarized, it will be witnessed by people who are not you. So they're gonna have to convince a couple of non-family members that they know what they're doing. What would be a measure of competence? It's a pretty low level of, of competence required. So uh, when I talk to, to a potential client about doing a power of attorney, my questions are, do you know why you're here to see me? If they can't tell me, they say, ask my son, he's sitting out in the front, then that's a, okay, that's a, that's a negative check mark. It uh, doesn't mean we can't proceed, but it immediately makes me think they're not really tracking on what's going on. Uh, oh, your son brought you down to do a power of attorney. Um, do you think that would be a good idea? Uh, I don't know. Do you think it would be a good idea? That's a check mark. Um, uh, if, but if they say, oh yeah, power of attorney, that's right, he did tell me. I, you know, I don't have any documents. I better do a power of attorney. Oh good, that indicates that they understand what the concept of power of attorney is. So as I say, it's a pretty low threshold, at least in my office, but, uh, but you got to have some level of understanding before you can sign that power of attorney document. And now we get to guardianship and conservatorship. Okay, a little language. 
Arizona uses the word guardian to mean a person who has been given authority over the person of another. So if I get to decide where Elizabeth lives and whether she gets medical care, I am her guardian in Arizona, if I've been appointed by the court. Conservator is the person who has been put in charge of another person's money. So we, we, talk, we lawyers talk about guardianship of the person and conservatorship of the estate. And why am I slowing down and saying this very deliberately and repeating it several times? Because not every state uses the same language. In California, for instance, they speak of conservator of the estate and, confusingly, conservator of the person. In New York, they talk about guardian of the person and, confusingly, guardian of the estate. And so you have to be careful when you talk to your brother in another state when you say, I'm going to go get guardianship over mom. You probably want to tell him exactly what you're getting because in his state, when he talks to the lawyer and says, my daughter, my sister is going to go get guardianship over mom, that lawyer is going to say, I knew she just wanted to get at the money. No, not in Arizona. Guardianship is just the person. Conservatorship is the estate. Is your Arizona guardianship valid when you go to California? Maybe. Is your California guardianship, well, it has to be a conservatorship, is your California conservatorship valid when you come to Arizona? Probably. Probably is stronger than, than maybe. And I cautiously, I intentionally chose California because California is a little bit of an outlier. It's less likely that your Arizona guardianship will be honored in California than in Colorado or Iowa or most of the East Coast. Um, and it is more likely that your out-of-state guardianship or conservatorship will do everything you need to do in Arizona than is true in most other states. We are pretty likely to honor your out-of-state documents. In general, in all of these arrangements here, when you are acting for somebody else, you are doing it in what's called a fiduciary capacity. You are, you are their alter ego, but you are not them. And so your creditors don't have access to their money you're doing this in that, uh, in that different capacity. When you're acting as fiduciary, you are not, you're not liable to take care of your, your, uh, your principal with your own money. So if you get guardianship or power of attorney over your dad, you don't have to use your money to pay for his nursing home bill. And your creditors don't get access to his money. They're really separate kinds of things. If you use a power of attorney, it doesn't come back on you. And and let me tease that out a little bit and tell you why you don't want to just put your kids' names on. I, I, if I had a dollar for every client who said, I just want to put my son's, or usually my daughter's, name on the account in case something happens to me, I always say, you mean like you die? Because we say die here, because that's what's <laughs> going to happen to you. <laughs> I don't do that. I always want to. Um, uh, if you put your daughter's name, if you walk into the bank and say, I want to put my daughter's name on the account in case something happens to me, what they will do every time is make her a joint tenant on your account. Yeah. And that means, guess what? You are exposed <laughs> to, to uh, liability for her creditors and vice versa. So you don't want to do joint tenancy. You want to use these fiduciary relationships, one of them, in a general way. Voluntary and involuntary mental health treatment, we got to talk about them as a separate kind of thing. They don't really involve um, substitute decision making except that when you're in the mental health system, they're making the decisions for you and even your agent on your power of attorney may be trumped by the mental health system. And I already flagged for you, there is such a thing as a mental health care power of attorney, so there's a little bit of interaction between the fiduciary surrogate decision-making process and the psychiatric care uh, arena as well. In a general way, the law makes a big distinction between those kinds of mental health treatment that look like chains and those that do not. Why do we make that distinction? Because we lawyers always reason by analogy. So we say, if the state wants to lock you up in the Pima County Jail or the Arizona State Prison, we're going to make them jump through a bunch of hoops before they do that. If they put you in the Arizona State Hospital or in a locked psychiatric ward, that looks a lot like prison, and so we're going to make them through, jump through a bunch of hoops before they do that. Whereas if you're in a nursing home and you're getting um, uh, psychiatric antipsychotic medications, we say, oh, that's not like chains at all. 
That's, uh, that's just medical care. And so we're not going to make people jump through a bunch of hoops to do that. That's an overgeneralizing. I don't want you to take that one to the bank. Advanced directives is a term for the whole collection of things that you do to say what you would want to have happen in the event that you became incapacitated. That can be a healthcare power of attorney. It can be a living will. It can be a, what's called a pre-hospital medical care directive, which is sometimes referred to as the orange form. It can even be a do, do not resuscitate order in some places, although the orange form and the do not resuscitate order are sort of overlaps in Arizona. Uh, it can be a, a letter to your child saying, if I ever was in a coma, here's what I would want. I'd want you to tickle my feet with a feather and, and uh, blow flour into my face to see if I sneeze. They can be very detailed. They can be very vague. They can be, uh, in your language, they can be forms. More important than all of this is the importance of having a conversation about it. So it's not enough, in my view, to get your mom to sign that healthcare power of attorney. She needs to tell you something about what she wants. When she says, oh, this is so difficult to talk about and you know what I want. No, you don't know what she wants. You know what you want and you can guess that since she raised you, you probably have similar values, but you don't really know what she wants. So ask her what she wants. Even if she's incapacitated, ask her what she wants. Why would you ask an incapacitated woman what she wants at, at, for end of life care? Why would you do that? They're incapacitated, right? Because two reasons. One is even her incapacitated self probably has some vestige of what she would have said when she was competent. And the other is if she says something different now, you kind of in a general way want to find, follow what she says now in her, in her incapacitated state. Uh, rather than making her miserable to either extend her life or not extend her life uh, over her objection. So, so that gets us to when you act as somebody else's fiduciary, guardian, agent, any position in which you're making decisions for someone else, your job is not to figure out what you would want if you were in their shoes. It's to figure out what they would want in their shoes if they could just wake up for a few minutes and have a rational conversation with you about it. And that, by the way, is what we in the legal system call substituted judgment. And that should be the way in which all of, uh, all of your decisions are made when you're making decisions for others.